Welcome to To The Point. Though the situation is continually evolving, when I sat down earlier with U.S. Senator Gary Peters, I wanted to get his take on the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what may lie ahead. Senator, I want to talk about something that the whole world is talking about, and that is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But I also want to stipulate that you and I are speaking earlier in the week, and portions of this will air on Saturday and Sunday for the show. Things will have changed mm -hmm. by then. But in general, you have some familiarity with this. You've been to Ukraine. Uh, you have military background. What are we expecting as, unfortunately, it seems like the weeks and months are going to roll by? Well, this, uh, the war just going to continue to, to drag on. And it could go for a long period of time. Uh, we know the Russians are concentrating their forces uh, right now and are kind of changing their battle plan. But certainly the Ukrainian military has just fought with incredible courage uh, and tenacity. Uh, we have been providing them with uh, advanced state-of-the-art uh, weapons that they have been able to use uh, very, very effectively, things like the Javelin anti-armor missiles. Uh, we see the devastation uh, that that is causing to to uh, Russian uh, armor uh, throughout the country. But it's just going to be a brutal fight. And, and unfortunately, the Russians have engaged in this campaign against civilians, uh, without question committing war crimes and just basically leveling uh, cities uh, and communities. It's uh, very horrific. I've heard the explanations, but I also hear the questions from people who ask me, why aren't we doing more as a country? Obviously, there are some NATO responsibilities that could come into play if this becomes more expansionist. But right now, is this all that you feel like we can do? Well, I think we want to be careful we don't escalate that and have U.S. Uh, soldiers and service uh, members uh, in combat. Uh, that would be an incredible escalation, and that would be... Uh, Men and women from uh, our military uh, dying in, in combat. I think we're going to try to avoid that uh, at all possible. But uh, clearly right now we have to provide the assistance uh, that the Ukrainian people need in terms of humanitarian aid. Uh, a recent budget we've spent $13 billion uh, to support both Ukrainians in country, in Ukraine, as well as uh, nearly 5 million that have now left Ukraine and are in refugee status. But also additional military equipment to make sure that the Ukrainian military has what they need in order to uh, fight off the Russians and, and clearly been affected so far. In fact, uh, outside of Kyiv, uh, they were engaged in uh, counter-offensives, not just defensive positions. They were actually taking the, the, the battle right to, to the Russians, uh, which shows how, how capable they are. One of the things the United States has done is put some sanctions against uh, the economy uh, of Russia. And in turn, one of the things that perhaps we should worry about is the kind of cyber uh, retaliation that we might see. I know it's something you've worked on. You've worked on cybersecurity from the Homeland Security uh, Committee, but uh, are, are we at greater danger now from getting cyber attacks from uh, from Russia? Yeah, I think we have to really be on our guard. Uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security and other security agencies have uh, put that out for uh, critical infrastructure. The Russians are engaged uh, in attacks against the United States uh, on a regular basis normally, even prior to the invasion of Ukraine, whether it was state-sponsored or you have criminal elements that uh, are in Russia and they operate with uh, the wink and nod from Mr. Uh, Putin uh, in attacks. So we've seen attacks, things like uh, the major pipeline, uh, colonial pipeline, which uh, shut that down and caused problems with the delivery of fuel in the southeastern part of our country. Uh, you're very likely we could see that again. They have very sophisticated operations. And, and I would warn folks even you know, in, in Michigan, uh, particularly smaller businesses that have been the victim of ransomware attacks, often originating from Russia with these criminal elements. And if a small business gets hit with a ransomware attack, it's estimated that half of those businesses will be out of business within 18 months. These are literally existential types of uh, threats uh, that our business community faces. So uh, we're on our guard, uh, and, but we need more tools. I just recently passed legislation that I authored uh, that uh, passed unanimously, and uh, one uh, major news outlet called, called it the most significant cyber legislation uh, passed in history uh, to give us better situational awareness, but we still have a lot more we have to do. When people think about getting attacked from a foreign government, uh, I, I think they may sometimes think, well, I'm just a small operator. I'm just this individual. They're not interested in me. These are uh, attacks of opportunity, right? Uh, I mean, they, they cast a wide net, and they don't really care. Uh, who they're attacking, do they? That's right. Yeah, you'll have very wide nets. And part, and part of the goal of, uh, of the Russian state will be to cause chaos 
cause problems uh, in the United States. Now, there, they will be targeting critical infrastructure, but what usually happens uh, in order to get to critical infrastructure, you always attack the weakest link, and sometimes it's the smaller companies th that are the weakest link that can then get them into a larger uh, organization. We've seen that in the past where uh, a major uh, credit card uh, company was attacked by using an air conditioning a uh, company that was a contractor uh, that they were able to get into the bigger system. So uh, vulnerabilities exist uh, with everybody. Let's talk domestically about some things that are going on. I know you're still working on a plan to get more semiconductors uh, into vehicles. Not, it's not just vehicles, I should point out. We think of it as vehicles uh, in Michigan, but it's for any number of appliances and uh, all across the manufacturing spectrum. Um, it's a big deal and it's a big problem because uh, not only do we have inflationary pressures out there that are created by any number of problems, not the least of which uh, we see gas prices that are impacted by the war which right. we just spoke, but also um, you, you, know, you got car prices because as they go up because cars aren't available. So where are we and what can the government do to kind of boost that along? Well, we have to secure our supply chains. It's pretty clear. We, we, we saw the vulnerabilities of supply chains through the pandemic uh, where we had very, very efficient supply chains, but they weren't resilient. And if anything happened, uh, they would uh, fray pretty quickly. And with bottom line, we're overly dependent on foreign suppliers for critical supplies. And in terms of the semiconductor chips, which is impacting the auto industry as well as other industries, you know, those come from China and South Korea and Taiwan. Uh, we need to have that production in the United States. We have to stop offshoring this stuff, particularly critical stuff like uh, chips that are in everything. Uh, the average car has over 10,000 chips uh, in a car, but you'll also find them in washing machines and everyday appliances. So uh, they're everywhere. And the one thing we know is that we're going to have even more chips. Uh, more and more new products uh, require even more chips. And you know, when you think of your car, just just pushing the button to have the the window go to go down, uh, that's a chip that uh, controls that. Unless we go back to the crank on the windows, uh, we're going to have chips, and you'll have more of them. So legislation actually that I wrote uh, provides uh, resources to provide incentives for companies to locate in the United States and not uh, produce that overseas. Uh, I've just named a conference committee that will negotiate the final version that we hope will get out of uh, the Congress uh, in the next few weeks. And just quickly for people who aren't familiar, a conference committee will be a group of senators, a group of members of the House. You have two similar bills. You'll get together and try to come up with one that both sides can agree with. Exactly. You know, that's uh, what it is. And I'm particularly pleased uh, because of the legislation that I wrote for, for what we call legacy chips, which are the older chips that are used by the auto industry, for example, to that. But also uh, there are a number of provisions related to cybersecurity, as well as by American provisions that I've worked on, and this will, but we're going to work very aggressively to keep those in the final legislation. One of the things people may not realize about being a member of Congress, and particularly one of the 100 in the, in the United States Senate, is that you deal with multiple areas of interest. And one area that you have been working on, I believe you went to the White House for signing of the bill, uh, is about the U.S. Post Office. And I suspect that most people on a daily basis don't think much about the U.S. Post Post office, but when you do think about it, it's pretty vital to everything that we do. Tell me about that legislation that, that you had signed into law. Well, uh, people do think about the Postal Service uh, when when they are getting their mail on right. time. You when, know, it's it's, not, when, when it's, it's not, not working. working. So yeah. we have to make sure it works. You know, the Postal Service is an incredible institution. It's the only uh, institution that delivers to every single household, every uh, single day, every address, no matter where you live. Uh, but uh, they have been under some real financial strain, particularly because of some requirements that were put on them 15 years ago that required them to fully pre-fund retiree health care for their employees, regardless of their age. They could be in their 20s, and you had to pre-fund all their health care for retirement. It makes no sense. There's no company in America that does that. There's no other federal agency that does that, or any government agency. So we needed to, to fix that. Uh, it's been a work in progress. I've worked on it the last two years, and I'm happy to say we were able to fix that. Uh, as well as integrating Medicare in for retirees, like every other company in America. Bottom line, the legislation that I wrote will, will save the Postal Service $49 billion over the next uh, 10 years. And that's money they can put into making sure they're investing in state-of-the-art processors and sorters and all of the modern equipment so that they can move mail efficiently 
and make sure that it's delivered uh, on time. So this is uh, now going to be able to put the Postal Service on sound financial footing for many, many years to come. I apologize for jumping from one subject to another because there are so many things that we want to cover, but I think a very significant development, uh, and I know you and I talked about this just before we started recording, that I think got a lot of attention. I'm not sure it got as much attention maybe as it would have if there wasn't all everything else going on, uh, but a significant milestone with uh, the confirmation of what will be the newest Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. Talk about how significant this nomination and this bipartisan, um, only three Republicans, but you got three Republicans uh, to confirm uh, for the first uh, black female on the highest court in the country. Well, uh, Judge Jackson, uh, soon to be Justice uh, Jackson, when she officially uh, takes uh, takes uh, office as a Supreme Court Justice, uh, was clearly historic. But she's just an incredible uh, woman. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet with her one on one. Uh, I know most folks have had the chance to see her through the the hearings uh, through the Judiciary Committee, and uh, I think she was uh, she was. Uh, handled by some members of the Senate in a very rough and, quite frankly, a nasty way, but she handled it with grace and with professionalism, and that's certainly the sense I got uh, in meeting her. She has uh, incredible intellect, she's very bright, but also has that judicial temperament of someone who you want uh, on the Supreme Court. And she brings experiences that no other justice uh, has on the court, and that's going to be incredibly important for people to have confidence that the Supreme Court is making decisions based uh, on the law. Uh, and doing it in a fair and impartial way. As a judge, she was considered one of the most impartial judges uh, on the federal bench prior to her nomination. That's exactly the kind of person we want on the Supreme Court. We've got about 45 seconds left. I just want to get your sense because uh, when you come back and, and you talk to us, I like to get a feel for what it's like in Washington. We know it started out pretty rough last January and we've come through this long tunnel of time. We know there's still a lot of partisan division and there's still a lot of rancor, but are we in a position, albeit it's an election year, um, that there is that we are coming to some cooperation again i refer to the bipartisan vote there yes and there are so so the postal reform bill something that was 15 years uh, in the making uh, that i worked on uh, i was able to get that passed through the senate with 79 votes uh, out of 100 broad bipartisan support the cybersecurity legislation that i mentioned uh, as uh, one of the most uh, expansive cyber protection bills to pass uh, out through congress i was able to pass that in the senate unanimously. Not easy to get 100 senators to agree on legislation, but that was my bill that uh, passed through the Senate. So there are ways that we can find common ground. It's things that I take great pride in. As you know, I work on a bipartisan way every opportunity I get, and those uh, certainly are, are two, I think, uh, examples of how we can come together. When we come back, we'll track the budget process in Lansing to the point.
Welcome back to To The Point. State Representative Tommy Brand talked with us late last week about the budget talks in Lansing. And I asked him to weigh in on the impact of the fatal shooting by a Grand Rapids police officer during a traffic stop more than a week ago. Representative, I have to start by talking uh, about the news that we have all seen this week, the videos released from the police shooting of Patrick Leoya, 26-year-old, who was killed during a traffic stop. And while the investigation is not finished, and I should point that out, there are a lot of things that we still don't know. We have seen the video, and I know that you have heard from people about it. Give me your take uh, on how this is impacting our community. Yeah, I know Patrick, what a good young, good looking young man, and too young to die. Um, I just I just got back from Lansing, and we just passed a budget and for higher ed, and I fought hard to get a million dollars for the Jim Crow Museum at Ferris State College, and I've been to this museum. They're going to build a new museum, and this museum shows what black people went through in the Jim Crow era, and it's terrible what the black people went through, just terrible. I think every police officer should go through this. I really do. Um, I, I've taken um, Representative Albert's been through it, Representative Love. She was a, a black state representative from Detroit area. She had tears in her eyes. So I think every officer, every officer should go through this. Also, I think every citizen maybe should have a ride along with officers to see what they go through, too. I mean, when they come up to a window, tin a window, not knowing whether they're going to get their head blown off, um, I think I think um, every citizen should should go through that. I know I've, I've gone, I've done a ride along, but it's I'm too young to die. Um, I trust pro Prosecutor Chris Becker. He's an honest, good man. I trust him to make the right decision. He's he knows more about the case than I do, a lot more, and it's his job to make the right decision. I trust he will. And of course, the Michigan State Police is investigating, and, and uh, Prosecutor Becker won't get that case until they're done. We don't know when that will. Yeah, I'm, and I'm head, I'm head of Michigan State Police approves, and um, and I will keep. Uh, I will. Any citizen that wants to get a hold of me, um, cell phone six one six six nine zero seven nine two eight. Um, I'm head of Michigan probe, so I, I'll stay on top of it too for um, for the community. Let's talk a little bit about the budgeting process, and you just referenced the higher education budget. Yeah. And as you and I sit and talk, this will be airing on the weekend, but you just got back from Lansing. You've just ca did. cast that vote. Um, uh, tell me about that budget. In addition to the million dollars for Ferris State, uh, there obviously is a lot more in there. There's a lot more. Um, I hate higher ed budget. It's, it's $1.2 billion of our general fund money, which could help out so many other budgets. But I voted it because that Ferris State million dollars meant so much to me. and. And also, they put a boilerplate in that the colleges would ha also have to have a 5% encourage. It's pretty weak, though. Encourage them to have 5% rate of day fund. Some of these colleges are 0 0.076 rate of day fund. That's not even, that's not even um, sustainable for them. So that's why I voted for it. But um, mainly because of the Jim Crow Museum getting a million dollars. And um, I'm a true politician because that, that won me over. <laughs> so. I'm guilty. <laughs> well, the the budget process is a little bit of give and take. I mean, there's never been a perfect budget. Nobody has seen a budget that come out of Lansing right. that is going to be 100% uh, perfect. But nobody's ever seen a budget come out of Lansing that's going to look like this one either, because there's a lot of extra money already, um, almost five billion dollars appropriated in a supplemental a few weeks ago. Um, and, and now I, what I am guessing is going to be a record budget again because of uh, the amount of money uh, in the state. You've watched this budget process. Obviously, you're involved. How do, of you, course. how do you feel in terms of this getting done? There's been a lot of talk about this getting done by that statutory deadline of July 1st. That's been a challenge for the past few years. Well, yeah, I think I, I hope we meet that challenge. I mean, um, I'm just writing a gigantic check to federal government I got to meet their challenge and make that deadline. I mean, we should meet our deadline. So I, I hope we can meet that deadline. And that's why we met today. We didn't even have session today, but we had met today to get that budget done. So I definitely hope we meet that budget. I mean, one thing that I'm, I'm Chairman Elbert has done a great job. Um, again, he went to um, Jim Crow with me. He's a great, good man. But one thing that I'd like to see in the future budgets is that um, the the water lines um, for lead pipe water lines. We have 330,000 
water lines that have lead, lead in it. And we don't have, we, I think we designate 136 million. That's not enough. I'm, I'd like to get about, one, about 1.5 billion, I don't know, for next, next supplemental to get for these water lines for the state of Michigan. I, I think, I mean, I, we took an oath, I took an oath to protect sa safety and health of Michigan people. And that's all Michigan people, and these water lines are, that's a lot of water lines. And we didn't, I don't think we gave enough money. There's also 300 and some odd thousand that are undecided that might have lead. So I'd, I'd really like to um, focus on that, and um, I'm going to fight for that. I'm very excited, too, for Secondary Road Patrol. I've been working on this five years. Every year, the sheriffs have to come and beg for Secondary Road Patrol money. Um, my bill gets $15 million out of the liquor tax money um, to supplement the second road. So s sheriffs have confidence that they can keep their sheriffs on the road. 75% of accidents happen on secondary road patrols. And um, I'm just so, that five years it took me to fight for this. I'm, I'm really f happy for that bill to get past the House yesterday. We've talked about that before, right? Because you haven't worked on it the entire time in your house. So, so what does that really mean for the Sheriff's Department? But they give them more money to put more, via, more sheriff's vehicles on the lesser traveled roads where those accidents take place? Yes, and that's where most accidents take place. Um, and sadly, drunk driving takes place there too. So yes. And so, yes, it does, and it, it gives them um, sustainable money. I mean, I can't run my business by, by just every day, you know, not knowing where, you know, you know where my money's going to come from, how much I'm going to charge for my food. This gives them sustainable money, and after every five years it goes up with inflation. Um, the, all the shares uh, um, supported it, all through 83 counties. Um, I'm so proud of that bill. Um, it, it passed. Now we got to get past the Senate, and I'm confident it will get past Senate. When you look at the rest of this term, notwithstanding there's an election out there, but uh, there is this big budget process to go through. There is more money in Lansing than there has ever been in terms of being able to spend. What are the challenges that you as a lawmaker face when it comes to trying to make decisions on some of that one-time money? Because this five billion, almost five billion that was appropriated, that money's not coming back. We're never going to see that kind of money again. So you have to make decisions based on spending at once, presumably without obligating the state to pay more down the road, right? Back to Chairman Albert, the Probst Chair, doing a great job. We're, we're making decisions that are that, that doesn't have to be sustained. You know, it's one-time projects, and that's back to my 1.5 billion. I'd like to get to because that's a one-time project, and that's. That to me, that's very important. So we're making decisions so we don't have to sustain it. You know, lame duck is good because I got 1.3 million for homeless people in my first term for lame duck. Lame duck is bad. We're building a 40 million dollar um, uh, visiting center on the Capitol. 40 million dollars. I'm, I'm guilty. I voted for it because I want to get some of this, my priorities. Like you said, that's the way politics works. Forty million dollars. Now, not, now that does have to be sustainable. You're still going to have to have maintenance and electric. And you know what? You know what the really visiting center is? It's a capital. That's the visiting center. That's history. That's where the kids go through. So, that's the good and the bad of politics and budget. And this budget, which under Chairman Albert's leadership, we are, we are doing things that don't have to be sustained like this $40 million. How difficult is that? It, and when I say difficult, it wouldn't sound like a pile of money would be a problem, but it can be. How difficult is that going to be to manage that and get a budget done and try to get all of the I's dotted and T's crossed on time? Yeah, it, it, you, would, you wouldn't think it would be difficult, you know, but it, it is. I got a, like a wish list like that big. And the problem is, um, you know, right down the street, I mean, I got people that can pay, barely pay their house payment and they're trying to buy, get grocery money with this inflation, this 8.2% inflation we have, the gas prices. Um, so some of these decisions have to be made thinking of them. You know, like I got the Grand Rapids Ballet, okay? Nothing against Grand Rapids Ballet, but I'm not that sorry ballet I'm not that pumped up for it you know I'd rather be able to help out the person down there that needs some rent money or some grocery money and um, and, and I had some of the budget things I, I, I agree with the governor I'm 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 my own person um, and I agree with the governor on like education um, I like green and governor on on um, earned income tax 
where it's going to, I look at my employees here, my cook, Jack, who works tonight, I look at his, his he's making good money, but that earned income tax would really help him and give him more money, maybe even a couple thousand dollars. Now the 3.9 that we voted for, and I voted for it because it helped a lot of, there's two other parts that helped pensions and it expanded the pensions from what the governor wanted. She just wanted one segment of pensions, expanded the pensions set to the whole state of Michigan for senior citizens. But that 3.9 doesn't help Jack to cook it. It's the going down for any of that income tax. It gives him maybe dollar twenty, dollar forty a week. Um, they earn income tax. Um, I agree with the governor on that. And I, again, I've told you this before. I mean, I don't bad I'll, I'll badmouth Outbacks or I don't badmouth Applebee's because I know what they go through and I know what the governor goes through. Um, she has some good ideas, and like myself, she has some bad ideas. <laughs> we'll be back with a final thought next to the point. In Lansing, the budget process is supposed to be done in less than 90 days. We'll keep following the progress and let you know about it every week to the point.